Recording by Tony Addison The Music Master of Babylon by Edgar Pangborn Part 2 At first, Brian could find no source for the faint light, the dim orange with a hint of motion that had no right to be here. He peered into the gloom of the auditorium, fixed his eyes on the oblong of blacker shadow that was the door he meant to use, but it told him nothing. The windows, of course. He had almost forgotten there were any. The light, hardly deserving the name, was coming through them. But sunset was surely well past. He had been here a long time, delaying and brooding before he played. Sunset should not flicker. So there was some kind of fire on the mainland. There had been no thunderstorm. How could fire start, over there, when no one ever came? He stumbled a few times, swearing petulantly, locating the doorway again, and groping through it into the hall of music. The windows out here were just as dirty. No use trying to see through them. There must have been a time when he had enjoyed looking through them. He stood shivering in the marble silence, trying to remember. He could not. Time was a gradual eternal dying. Time was a long growth of dirt and ocean salt, sealing in, covering over forever. He stumbled for his cave, hurrying now, and lit two candles. He left one by the cold stove, and used the other to light his way down the stairs to his raft. Once down there, he blew it out afraid. The room a candle makes in the darkness is a vulnerable room. With no walls, it closes in a blindness. He pulled the raft by the guide-rope gently, for fear of noise. He found his canoe tied as he had left it. He poked his white head slowly beyond the sill, staring west. Merely a bonfire gleaming, reddening the blackness of the cliff. Brian knew the spot, a ledge almost at water level. At one end of it, was the troublesome path he used in climbing up to the forest. Usable driftwood was often there, the supply renewed by the high tides. No, Brian said, oh no. Unable to accept or believe or not believe, he drew his head in, resting his forehead on the coldness of the silk, waiting for dizziness to pass reason to return. Then, rather calm, he once more leaned out over the sill. The fire still shone, and was therefore not a disordered dream of old age, but it was dying to a dull rose of embers. He wondered a little about time. The museum clocks and watches had stopped long ago. Brian had ceased to want them. A sliver of moon was hanging over the water to the east. He ought to be able to remember the phases, deduce the approximate time from that. But his mind was too tired or distraught to give him the necessary data. Maybe it was somewhere around midnight. He climbed on the silk, and, with grunting effort, lifted the canoe over it, to the motionless water inside. Wasted energy, he decided, as soon as that struggle was over. That fire had been lit before daylight passed. Whoever lit it would have seen the canoe, might even have been watching Brian himself come home from his hunting. The canoe's disappearance in the night would only rouse further curiosity. But Brian was too exhausted to lift it back. Why assume that the maker of the bonfire was necessarily hostile? Might be good company. Might be. 
Brian pulled his raft through the darkness, secured it at the stairway, and groped back to his cave. He then locked the door. The venison was waiting, the sight and smell of it making him suddenly ravenous. He lit a small fire in the stove, one that he hoped would not be still sending smoke from the ventilator shaft when morning came. He cooked the meat crudely and wolfed it down, all enjoyment gone at the first mouthful. He was shocked then to discover the dirtiness of his white beard. He hadn't given himself a real bath in weeks. He searched for scissors and spent an absent-minded while trimming the beard back to shortness. He ought to take some soap, valuable stuff, down to Moses' room and wash. Clothes, too. People probably still wore them. He had worn none for years, except for sandals and a clout and a carrying satchel for his trips to the mainland. He had enjoyed the freedom at first, and especially the discovery in his rugged fifties that he did not need clothes even for the soft winters, except perhaps a light covering when he slept. Then almost total nakedness had become so natural it required no thought at all. But the owner of that bonfire, he checked his rifles. The point twenty two automatic, an army model from the twenty forties, was the best. The tiny bullets carried a paralytic poison, graze a man's finger, and he was painlessly dead in three minutes. Effective range with telescopic sights, three kilometres. Weight, a scant five pounds. He sat a long time, cuddling that triumph of military science, listening for sounds that did not come, wondering often about the unknowable passage of night toward day. Would it be two o'clock? He wished he could have seen the satellite, renamed in his mind the Midnight Star. But when he was down there at his port, he had not once looked up at the night sky. Delicate and beautiful, bearing its everlasting freight of men, who must have been dead now for twenty-five years, and who would be dead a very long time. Well, it was better than a clock, Brian often thought, if you happen to look at the night sky at the right time of the month, when the man-made star could catch the moonlight. But he had not seen it tonight. Three o'clock? At some time during the long dark, he put the rifle away on the floor. With studied, self-conscious contempt for his own weakness, he strode out noisily into the hall of music with a fresh-lit candle. This same bravado he knew might dissolve at the first alien noise. While it lasted, though, it was invigorating. The windows were still black with night, as if the candle flame had found its own way. Brian was standing by the ancient marimba in the main hall, the light slanting carelessly away from his thin, high-veined hand. Nearby, on a small table, sat the Stone Age clay image he had brought long ago from the director's meeting-room on the fifteenth floor. It startled him. He remembered quite clearly how he himself had placed it there, obeying a half-humorous whim. The image and the singing stones were both magnificently older than history, so why shouldn't they live together? Whenever he dusted the marimba, he dusted the image respectfully and its pedestal. It would not have taken much urging from the impulses of a lonely mind, he supposed, to make him place offerings before it and bow down, winking first, of course, to indicate that rituals suitable to two aging gentlemen did not have to be sensible in order to be good. But now the clay face, recapitulating eternity, startled him. 
possibly some flicker of the candle had given it a new mimicry of life. Though worn with antiquity, it was not deformed. The chipped places were simple, honourable scars. The two faces stared mildly from the single head. There were plain, stylized lines to represent folded hands, equally artless marks of sex on either side. That was all. The maker might have intended it to be a child's toy or a god. A wooden hammer of modern make rested on the marimba. Softly, Brian tapped a few of the stones. He struck the shrillest one harder, waking many slow-dying overtones, and laid the hammer down, listening, until the last murmur perished, and a drop of hot wax hurt his thumb. He returned to his cave and blew out the candle, thinking of the door, not caring that he had, in irrational bravado, left it unlocked. Face down, he rolled his head and clenched his fingers into his palate, seeking in pain and finding at last the relief of stormy, helpless weeping in the total dark. Then he slept. They looked timid. The evidence of it was in their tense, squatting pose, not in what the feeble light allowed Brian to see of their faces, which were as blank as rock. Hunched down just inside the open doorway of the cloakroom cave, a dim morning greyness from the hall of music behind them, they were ready for flight. Brian's intelligence warmed his body to stay motionless, for readiness for flight could also be readiness for attack. He studied them, lowering his eyelids to a slit. On his pallet well inside the cave, he must be in deep shadow. They were aware of him, though keenly aware. They were very young, perhaps sixteen or seventeen years old, firm-muscled, the man slim but heavy in the shoulders, the girl a fully developed woman. They were dressed alike, loincloths of some coarse, dull fabric, and moccasins that might be deer-hide. Their hair grew nearly to the shoulders, and was cut off carelessly there, but they were evidently in the habit of combing it. They appeared to be clean. Their complexion, so far as Brian could guess it in the meagre light, was the brown of a heavy tan. With no immediate awareness of emotion, he decided they were beautiful, and then, within his own poised, perilous silence, Brian reminded himself that the young are always beautiful. Softly, Brian saw no motion of her lips. The woman muttered, He wake. A twitch of the man's hand was probably meant to warn her to be quiet. His other hand clutched the shaft of a javelin with a metal blade. Brian saw that the blade had once belonged to a bread-knife. It was polished and shining, lashed to a peeled stick. The javelin trailed, ready for use at a flick of the young man's arm. Brian opened his eyes plainly. Deliberately, he sighed. "'Good morning!' The youth said, "'Good morning, sir.' "'Where do you come from?' "'Milston.' The young man spoke automatically, but then his facial rigidity dissolved into amazement and some kind of distress. He glanced at his companion, who giggled uneasily. "'The old man pretends to not know,' she said, and smiled and seemed to be waiting for the young man's permission to go on speaking. He did not give it, but she continued, "'Sir, the old ones of Millstone are dead.' She thrust her hand out, and down, flat, a picture of finality, adding with nervous haste, "'As the old man knows, he who told us to call him Jonas, she who told us to call her Abigail, they are dead. They are still without moving for six days.' 
then we do the burial as they told us as the old man knows but i don't know said brian and sat up on his pallet too quickly startling them but their motion was backward readiness for flight not for aggression milston where is milston both looked wholly bewildered then dismayed they stood up with splendid animal grace stepping backward out of the cave the girl whispering in the man's ear brian caught only two words he's angry he jumped up don't go please don't go he followed them out of the cave slowly now aware that he might well be an object of terror in the half-dark aware of his gaunt graceless age and dirty hacked-off beard almost involuntarily he adopted something of the flat stilted quality of their speech i will not hurt you do not go they halted the girl smiled dubiously the man said we need old ones they die he who told us to call him jonas said many days in the boat not with the sun path he said across the sun path he said keeping land on the left hand we need old ones to speak the to speak the old man is angry no i am not angry i am never angry brian's mind groped certain of nothing no one had come for twenty-five years only twenty-five millstone there was red gold on the dirty eastern windows of the hall of music a light becoming softness as it slanted down touching the long rows of cases the warm brown of an antique spinet the arrogant clean gold of a twentieth-century harp the dull grey of singing stones five thousand years old and a clay face much older than that millstone brian pointed southwest in inquiry the girl nodded pleased and not at all surprised that he should know watching him now with a squirrel's stiff curiosity hadn't there once been a millstone river in or near princeton he thought he remembered that it emptied into the raritan canal there was some moderately high ground around their islands now no doubt or well perhaps they would tell him there were old people in millstone he said trying for gentle dignity and they died so now you need old ones to take their place the girl nodded vigorously a glance at the young man was full of shyness possessiveness maybe some amusement he who told us to call him jonas said no marriage can be without the words of abraham i am Br brian checked himself if this was religion it would not do to speak the name abraham with a rising inflection at least not until he knew what it stood for i have been for a long time he checked himself again a man old ugly and strange enough to be sacred should never stoop to explain anything they were standing by the seven stone marimba his hand dropped his thumbnail clicking by accident against the deepest stone and waking a murmur the children drew back alarmed brian smiled don't be afraid he tapped the other stones lightly it is only music it will not hurt you he was silent a while and they were patient and respectful waiting for more light he asked carefully he who told you to call him jonas he taught you all the things you know all things the boy said and the girl nodded quickly so that the soft brownness of her hair tumbled about her face and she pushed it back in a small human motion as old as the clay image do you know how old you are they looked blank then the girl said oh summers she held up both hands with spread fingers then one hand three fives as the old man knows i am very old said brian i know many things but sometimes i wish to forget and sometimes i wish to hear what others know 
even though I may know it myself. They looked uncomprehending and greatly impressed. Brian felt a smile on his face and wondered why it should be there. They were nice children, born ten years after the death of a world, or twenty perhaps. I think I am twenty-six, but did I drop a decade somewhere and never notice the damn thing? He who told you to call him Jonas, he taught you all that you know about Abraham? At sound of the name, both of them made swift circular motions, first at the forehead, then at the breast. He taught us all things, the young man said, he and she who told us to call her Abigail, the hours to rise, to pray, to wash, to eat, the laws for hunting, and I know the Abraham words for that. Sol Amra, I take this for my need. Brian felt lost again, dismally lost, and looked down to the grave clay faces of the image for counsel and found none. They who told you to call them Jonas and Abigail, they were the only old ones who lived with you. Again that look of bewilderment. The only ones, sir, the young man said, as the old man knows. I could never persuade them that being old, I know very nearly nothing. Brian straightened to his full gaunt height. The young people were not tall, though stiff and worn with age. Brian knew he was still a bonily overpowering creature. Once among men, he had mildly enjoyed being more than life-size. As a shield for the lonely, frightened thing that was his mind, he put on a phony sternness. I wish to examine you about Millstone and your knowledge of Abraham, how many others are living at Millstone? Two five, sir, said the boy promptly, and I, who may be called Jonas Sam, and this one we may call Paula. Two five and two. We are the biggest, we two. The others are only children, but he we call Jimmy has killed his deer. He sees after them now, while we go across the sun-path. Under Brian's questioning, more of the story came, haltingly, obscured by the young man's conviction that the old man already knew everything. Sometime, probably in the middle twenty-eighties, Jonas and Abigail, whoever they were, had come on a group of twelve wild children who were keeping alive somehow in a ruined town where their elders had all died. Jonas and Abigail had brought them all to an island they called Millstone. Jonas and Abigail had come originally from up across the sun path. The boy seemed to mean north, and they had been very old, which might mean anything between thirty and ninety. In teaching the children primitive means of survival, Jonas and Abigail had brought off a brilliant success. Jonason and Paula were well fed, shining with health and cleanliness, and the strength of wildness, and their speech had not been learned from the ignorant. Its pronunciation faintly suggested New England, so far as Brian could detect any local accent at all. Did they teach you reading and writing? he asked, and made writing motions on the flat of his palm, which the two watched in vague alarm. The boy asked, What is that? Never mind, he thought. I could quarrel with some of your theories, Mr. Whom I may call Jonas. Well, tell me now what they taught you of Abraham. Both made again that circular motion at forehead and breast, and the young man said, with the stiffness of recitation, Abraham was the son of heaven who died that we might live. The girl, 
her obligations discharged with the religious gesture, tapped the marimba shyly, fascinated, and drew her finger back sharply, smiling up at Brian in apology for her naughtiness. He taught the laws, the everlasting truth of all time, the boy recited, almost gabbling, and was slain on the wheel at Nuba by the infidels, therefore since he died for us, we look up across the sun-path, when we pray to Abraham Brown, who will come again. Abraham Brown? But, but I knew him, Brian thought stunned. I met him once. Nuba. Newburg, The temporary capital of the Soviet of... Oh, the hell with that. Met him in 2071. He was a hundred and two years old then. Could still walk, speak clearly, even remember an unimportant concert of mine from years before. I could have picked him up in one hand, but nobody was ever more alive. The wheel? And when did he die, boy? Brian asked. Jonas moved fingers, helplessly embarrassed. Long, long ago. He glanced up, hopefully, a thousand years. I think he who told us to call him Jonas did not ever teach us that. I see, never mind. Oh, my good doctor, after all, artist, statesman, student of ethics, philosopher, you said that if men knew themselves, they would have the beginning of wisdom. Your best teacher was Socrates. Well, you knew it, and now look what's happened. Jonas and Abigail, some visionary pair, Brian supposed, may be cracking up under the ghastliness of those years, admirers of Brown, perhaps, shocked probably, away from the religions of the twenty-first century, which had all failed to stop the horrors. Nevertheless, they needed one, or were convinced that the children did, so they created one. There must later have been some dizzying pride of creation in it, possibly wholehearted belief in themselves, too, as they found the children accepting it, building a ritual life around it. It was impossible, Brian thought, that Jonas and Abigail could have met the living Abraham Brown, as anyone must who faces the limitations of human intelligence. Brown had accepted mysteries, but he did not make them. He was wholly without intellectual arrogance. No one could have talked with him five minutes without hearing him say tranquilly, I don't know. The wheel at Nuba, the wheel? Brian realised he could never learn how Brown had actually died, even if he had the strength and courage to go back north. No, at seventy-six, eighty-six, one can hardly make a fresh start in the study of history, not without the patience of Abraham Brown himself, who had probably been doing just that when the wheel an awed question from the girl pulled Brian from a black pit of abstraction. What is that? She was pointing to the clay image in its dusty sunlight. Brian spoke vaguely, almost deaf to his own words, until they were past recovering. That it is very old, very old, and very sacred. She nodded round-eyed, and stepped back a pace or two. And that? That was all they taught you of Abraham Brown? Astonished, the boy asked, Is it not enough? There is always the project. Why, perhaps. We know all the prayers, old man. Yes, I'm sure you do. The old man will come with us? Eh? There is always the project. Come with you? We look for old ones, said the young man. There was a new note in his voice, and the note was impatience. We travelled many days, up across the sun-path. We want you to speak the Abraham words for marriage. The old ones said we must not mate as the animals do without the words. We want marry, of course, said Brian feebly, rubbing his great long-fingered hand across his face, so that the words were blurred and dull, and naturally beget replenished the earth untired. I don't know any Abraham words for marriage. Go on and marry. Try again. Try. 
but the old one said wait brian cried wait let me think did he he who told you to call him jonas did he teach you anything about the world as it was in the old days before you were born before the old man makes fun of us no no and since he now had to fight down physical fear as well as confusion brian spoke more harshly than he intended answer my question what do you know of the old days i was a young man once do you understand as young as you what do you know about the world i lived in jonason laughed there was new-born doubt in him as well as anger stiffening his shoulders narrowing his innocent grey eyes there was always the world he said ever since god made it a thousand years ago was there i was a musician do you know what a musician is the young man shook his head watching brian too alertly watching his hands aware of him in a new way no longer humble paula sensed the tension and did not like it she said worriedly politely we forget some of the things they taught us sir they were old ones most of the days they were away from us in places where we were not to go praying old ones are always praying i will hear this old man pray said jonason the butt of the javelin rested against jonason's foot the blade swaying from side to side a wrong word any trifle brian knew could make them decide in an instant that he was evil and not sacred their religion would certainly require a devil he thought also merely one of the many ways of dying it would be swift which is always a consideration certainly you may hear me pray said brian abruptly come this way in a fluctuating despair he knew that he must not become angry as a climber stumbling at the edge of a cliff might order himself not to be careless come this way my prayers i'll show you i'll show you what i did when i was a young man in a world you never knew he stalked across the hall of music not looking behind but his back sensed every glint of light on that bread knife javelin come this way he shouted come in here he flung open the door of the auditorium and strode up on the platform sit down over there and be quiet they did he thought he could not look at them he knew he was muttering too between his noisy outbursts as he snatched the cover off the steinway and raised the lid muttering bits and fragments from old times and from the new times they went that away oh mr van ander it just simply goes right through me i can't express it madam such was my intention or as brahms is supposed to have said on a slightly different subject any ass knows that brio roboto and schmaltz went to see in a jonason paula this is a piano it will not hurt you sit there be quiet listen he found calm now if ever now when i have living proof that human nature some sort of human nature is continuing surely now if ever the project with the sudden authority that was natural to him andrew carr took over in the stupendous opening chords of the introduction brian very nearly forgot his audience not quite though the youngsters had sat down out there in the dusty region where none but ghosts had lingered for twenty-five years or more the piano's first sound brought them to their feet brian played through the first four bars piling the chords like mountains then held the last one with the pedal and waved his right hand at jonason and paula in a furious downward motion he thought they understood he thought he saw them sit down again but he could pay them scant attention now for the sonata was coming alive under his fingers waking growing rejoicing 
he did not forget the youngsters again they were important terrifying too important at the fringe of awareness but he could not look at them any more he shut his eyes he had never played like this in the flood of his prime in the old days before great audiences that loved him never his eyes were still closed holding him secure in a secret world that was not all darkness when he ended the first movement paused very briefly and moved on with complete assurance to explore the depth and height of the second this was a true statement at last this was andrew carr he lived even if after this late morning he might never live again and now the third the storm and the wrath the interludes of calm the anger denials affirmations was there anything he didn't know this heir of three centuries who died in jail without hesitation without any awareness of self of age or pain or danger or loss brian was entering on the broad reaches of the last movement when he opened his eyes the youngsters were gone well he thought it's too big it frightened them away he could visualize them stealing out with backward looks of panic incomprehensible thunder but he could not think much about them now not while andrew carr was with him he played on with the same assurance the same joyful sense of victory savages let them go with leave and goodwill some external sound was faintly troubling him something that must have begun under cover of these rising peeling octave passages storm waves each higher than the last until it seemed that even a superhuman swimmer must be exhausted an undefinable alien noise a kind of humming brian shook his head peevishly shutting it away it couldn't matter at least not now everything was here in the beautiful labours his hands still had to do the waves were growing more quiet settling subsiding and now he must play those curious arpeggios which he had never quite understood but of course he understood them at last ripped them out of the piano like showers of sparks like distant lightnings moving farther off across a world that could never be at rest the final theme why it was a variation and how was it that he had never realized it a variation on a theme of brahms from the german requiem quite plain quite simple and brahms would have approved still it was rather strange brian thought that he had never made the identification before in spite of all his study well he knew it now blessed are the dead yes brian thought but something more remained and he searched for it proudly certain of discovering it through the mighty unfolding of the finale no hurrying no crashing impatience any more but a moving through time with no fear of time through radiance and darkness with no fear of either andrew carr was happy the light of the sun on his shoulders that they may rest from their labours and their works do follow after them brian stood up swaying and out of breath so the music was over and the young savages were gone and somewhere a jangling humming confusion was filling the hall of music distant but entering with violence even here now that the piano was silent brian moved stiffly out of the auditorium more or less knowing what he would find the noise was immense the unchecked overtones of the marimba fuming and quivering as the high ceiling of the hall of music caught and twisted them flung them back against the answering strings of harps and pianos and violins the sulky membranes of drums the nervous brass of cymbals the girl was playing it really playing it brian laughed once softly in the shadows and was not heard she had hit on a most primeval rhythm natural for children or savages and needed nothing else hammering it out swiftly on one stone and then the next 
wanting no rest or variation. The boy was dancing, slapping his feet, pounding his chest, thrusting out his javelin in perfect time to the clamour, edging up to his companion, grimacing, drawing back to return. Neither was laughing or close to laughter. Their faces were savage, solemn, downright grim with the excitement, the innocent lust, as spontaneous as the drumming of partridges. It was a while before they saw Brian in the shadows. The girl dropped the hammer. The boy froze briefly, the javelin raised, then jerked his head slightly at Paula, who snatched at something. Only moments later did Brian realise that she had taken the clay image before she fled. Jonason covered her retreat, stepping backward, his face blank with fear and readiness, javelin poised. So swiftly, so easily, by grace of a few wrong words, and Steinway's best, had a sacred old one become a bad old one, an evil spirit. They were gone down the stairway, leaving the echo of Brian's voice crying, Don't go, please don't go, I beg you. Brian followed them unwillingly. It was a measure of his unwillingness that moments passed before he was at the bottom of the stairway, looking across the shut-in water to his raft, which they had used and left at the window-sill port. Brian had never been a good swimmer. He was too dizzy now and short of breath to attempt to reach it. He clutched the rope and hitched himself panting, hand over hand, to the window, collapsing there a while, until he found strength to scramble into his canoe and grope for the paddle. The youngster's canoe was already far off, heading up the river, the boy paddling with deep, powerful strokes. Up the river, of course. They had to find the right kind of old ones, up across the sun-path. Brian dug his blade in the quiet water. For a time... His rugged, ancient muscles were willing. There was sap in them yet. Perhaps he was gaining slightly. He shouted hugely, Bring back my two-faced god! Bring it back! It's not yours! It's not yours! They must have heard his voice booming at them. At any rate, the girl looked back once. The boy, intent on his effort, did not. Brian roared, Bring back my god! I want my little god! He was not gaining on them. They had a mission, after all. They had to find the right kind of old ones. But damn it, Brian thought, my world has some rights, hasn't it? We'll see about this. He lifted the paddle like a spear and flung it knowing even before his shoulder winced how absurd the gesture was. The youngsters were so far away that even an arrow from a bow might not have reached them. The paddle splashed in the water, not far away, a small infinity. It swung about to the will of the river, the heavy end pointing obediently downstream. It nuzzled companionably, against a grey-faced chunk of driftwood, diverting it, so that presently the driftwood floated into Brian's reach. He caught it, and flung it toward the paddle, hoping it might fall on the other side, and send the paddle near him. It fell short, and in his oddly painless extremity, Brian was not surprised, but merely watched the grey driftwood floating and bobbing along beside him, with an irritation that was part friendliness, for it suggested the face of a music critic he had met in New Boston, was it Denver, London? He couldn't remember. Why, he said aloud, detachedly observing the passage of his canoe beyond the broad morning shadow of the Museum of Human History, I seem to have made sure to die. Mr. Van Ander, has abundantly demonstrated a mastery of the instrument and of the you acid fraud go play salfageo on your linotype don't bother me and of the literature which could without exaggeration be termed beyond technique 
he is one of those rare interpreters who at the last analysis i can't swim it you know said brian have so deeply submerged dedicated themselves that they may truly be said to have become one with gaining on the canoe the grey-faced chip moved tranquilly placidly approving toward the open sea and with a final remnant of strength brian inched forward to the bow of the canoe and gathered the full force of his lungs to shout up the river go in peace they could not have heard him they were too far away and a new morning wind was blowing fresh and sweet out of the northwest End of the Music Master of Babylon by Edgar Pangborn